Welcome. So I'm thrilled to be the first person to welcome you to Family and Alumni Weekend. We are so pleased you are here. Uh, my name is Maud Mandel, and I am the Dean of the College. And that means I am in the fortunate position of working with our students on shaping their education while they're here on College Hill. It's a terrific job, first and foremost because the population that I work with every day, Brown students, are such an extraordinary mix of intellectual risk takers and exploratory learners. So if you are here in the audience because you are the parent of one of these exceptional students, I can only say thank you for sharing your children with us for a stretch. And I would like to give you a round of applause for producing such marvelous students. Thank you. It really is an honor and a privilege to have an opportunity to help shape their educational journey. And if you're here as an alum, you know what I'm talking about. You shared your time here with an amazing group of people who embarked on a creative intellectual journey together, and it's great to have you back here with us. I hope that whatever brings you here, you have the opportunity to take part in some of what makes life on this campus such a powerful experience for so many people every day. In particular, I'd encourage you to attend one of the eight academic forums scheduled this weekend. These discussions, led by Brown faculty, cover everything from money and politics to virtual reality to designing new musical instruments. We hope they'll give you a taste of some of the dynamic research and teaching our students encounter here every day. And of course, there is football, Brown versus Princeton over at the stadium. Please come and cheer on our players. There will also be several opportunities to meet with deans and senior administrators to learn about the wide range of curricular and co-curricular activities on campus. Tomorrow morning, I will be uh, host hosting a session with some Campus Life colleagues uh, to answer your questions about life here on campus and academics on campus. And if you're the parent of a sophomore, I have a special session at 2 o'clock on guiding sophomores uh, through their path here at Brown. I encourage you to come. I encourage you to bring your sophomores with you. They might pick up a few tips uh, as well. Uh, the president will be herself holding some op open office hours and meeting with alum at various at, at a reception. Uh, and she too looks forward to welcoming you and talking to you this weekend. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Marcy Sandler and Jim Janover. Marcy is an emeritus board chair of the Citizens Committee for Children of New York, an advocacy group. She holds an AB from Brown in International Relations and an MBA from Columbia. Jim is Managing Director and Head of Global Risk at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. He holds an AB from Brown in History, my department, very excited to, read, to learn about that, and a JD from Harvard Law. Until this past May, Marcy and Jim served as co-chairs of the Parents Leadership Council. They have a daughter, Kate, from the class of 18, who's now a sophomore, uh, and are staying on the council in a member role. Their son, William, graduated Brown in 2015. Marcy and Jim are both class of 1986. They will both be serving on their 30th reunion committee this year. Together, they've also served on the 5th, 30th, and 25th reunion gift committees. I'm sorry. 5th, 20th, and 25th reunion committees. Marcy's also a member of the Women's Leadership Council. It's really my great pleasure and honor to introduce them to you today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Dean Mandel, for such lovely remarks. Um, look, Marcy and I uh, uh, share in welcoming everyone um, to this uh, wonderful, exciting uh, family weekend, and especially this uh, family weekend uh, keynote address. Uh, as members of the class of uh, 86, and as Dean Mendel mentioned, you know, parents of uh, a recent graduate and our daughter Kate, sophomore here uh, this evening, we're obviously thrilled and honored to be able to uh, introduce uh, President Paxson uh, this evening. Uh, look, as, as Dean Mendel mentioned, we've been uh, fortunate to be very involved at Brown, both in terms of our alumni role, uh, and also as, uh, as parents uh, and working on the Parents uh, Leadership Council. And I think that that's really given us an opportunity to have a broad perspective on just how special a place uh, Brown is and how it continues 
uh, to have such an important role for both uh, students, their families, um, and the community at large. Thank you, Jim. So, <laughs> so for all the new parents who are gathered here, I think you'll find, as we have, that Brown will embolden your children, give them a true sense of the possibilities open to them, and ensure that they're well prepared for life after graduation. We so enjoyed building strong relationships with our professors and our Brown friends. And as you can see by the number of alumni here this weekend, that strong sense of community is shared by so many. And now, President Christina Paxson is making the experience even more extraordinary through the vision that she's articulated in her strategic plan for Brown's future. Over the past three years, we've truly had the pleasure of working with her, a true pleasure, and are inspired by the leadership she has shown and her understanding of Brown's unique culture. Her brother, Will, graduated from Brown with the class of 75, so she's been part of our community for decades, and now she's a newly minted Brown parent. All of this means that she's keenly aware of Brown's strengths and the opportunities that exist here for growth and continued social impact. In her time as president thus far, she's fashioned a future plan for the university that will expand access to education for students from all backgrounds, provide students with increased options for experiential learning, and cement Brown's leadership in areas of crucial importance to society. She is in her own right a distinguished scholar and outstanding teacher committed to maintaining maintaining Brown's place at the forefront of undergraduate education, research, and community service. Jim and I have been delighted to get to know her and see her plans for the university blossom. We're excited to have her leading Brown forward and honored to introduce her to you. Please join me in welcoming Brown's 19th president, Christina Paxson. Thank you. Uh, it, is, it is just great to be here, I guess I should say this evening, and thanks to Jim and Marcy for your kind introduction. A very warm welcome to all of the parents and alumni who are here this evening. Uh, you know, Family and Alumni Weekend has barely begun. Uh, we have a very active campus, but I love seeing just the added vibrancy when all of you come onto campus. I actually had a, I, I must have been a little brother or sister of a Brown student, uh, threw me a frisbee. I got to play frisbee on the green today for the first time. I was so excited. Uh, maybe I can do that more in the future. Uh, but, but this is the first of several opportunities I will have over the next few days to spend time with you. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A session with parents right here uh, tomorrow at 4, p uh, 4 p.m. And also seeing the alumni at the alumni recognition ceremony and reception tomorrow evening. So just the beginning, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, of course, there is also football, as Maude Mandel mentioned. Uh, it is Brown versus Princeton. Many of you may know that I came to Brown from Princeton. So it won't surprise you to know that I will not be wearing orange and black. And I will expect a Brown victory. It's very important. <laughs> now, you, you may not know that this is actually the first of two very important back-to-back -back weekends here at Brown. Uh, you may know that next weekend, members of the Brown Corporation will gather here in their role as stewards of the university. And we will, at that point, launch a comprehensive fundraising campaign. Brown's next campaign aimed at nothing less than achieving a new level of academic excellence for current students and for generations to come. This is truly a, a big moment. I, it's a defining moment for Brown. And so this evening, I want to share with you uh, our vision for the future and how that vision will be supported by the campaign. It's a vision built around investment in our very top priorities. It's a vision for tomorrow's Brown, and it's a vision for Brown solving tomorrow's problems. It's very exciting. Now, all of you probably know, at least it's something I'm very aware of, that the basic building blocks of all universities are the same. They are people. They're programs, and they're the campus and the community that support people and programs. What differenti differentiates universities is how these basic building blocks are put together. And the way we put them together here at Brown, 
is very distinctive. And I like to think that it's really informed very deeply by the open curriculum. Uh, the open curriculum is more than just a way of kind of guiding students through their courses while they're here. It's really a philosophy that guides our overall approach to education and to research. So what I want to talk about tonight is how the university will meet the bold aspirations it set out for the building blocks of tomorrow's Brown. So how will we invest in people who are absolutely committed to rigorous, independent, intellectual inquiry? How will we support academic programs that foster collaboration and bring these people and their ideas together in very inventive and beneficial ways? And how will we build and sustain a campus community that supports our very unique academic approach as well as the full and active lives of all members of the Brown community? So by the end of my talk, I want you to know how the transformative work that we're doing at Brown shows up in students' day-to-day -day lives. I want you to feel in your bones, if you don't know already, and many of the alumni do, what it means to learn in an open curriculum. And I want you to see how Brown's distinctive brand of teaching and research can open doors and transform lives. And I want you, finally, to believe in Brown, as I do, not only because I'm its president right now, or, and not only because my youngest son, uh, Ben, made a very independent, it was all his own judgment, to come here to school, uh, but really because of how Brown prepares students to be consequential and to make a difference in the world through their education. So let's start with people. What is it about the people of Brown? And there is something very distinctive. How is it that the constellations of people and the ideas at Brown so often push boundaries? And it really is boundary pushing that I see on a regular basis in very positive ways. Throughout its history, Brown has attracted faculty and students drawn to the core values of openness, collaboration, and fierce intellectual independence. It was Brown's fourth president, Francis Wayland, who said, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, that students should be able to, quote, study what they choose, all that they choose, and nothing but what they choose. And on the strength of this very iconoclastic foundation, Brown continued to evolve with the times and continually reset itself for excellence and leadership. In 1969, just a little bit of Brown history, and the alumni in the audience know this well, Brown outdid itself by creating the open curriculum, an investment in the notion that people learn with purpose and with joy by having the freedom to put ideas together in deliberate and interesting ways of their own making. So, you know, just think about this. We talk about the open curriculum all the time, but think about it. Think about the academic energy that changing to that curriculum set in motion. Think about the open and intense academic climate that this established. Think about the attraction that this climate had for faculty who came from around the world, diverse points of view, who wanted to work with students who would push boundaries, push limits, and work with them to advance knowledge. Brown really has just a special vibe, and I think it comes from the open curriculum. It's the kind of place that Thomas Edison might have thrived, unfortunately he didn't come to Brown, when he said, hell, there are no rules here, we're trying to accomplish something. <laughs> and this kind of attitude is music to the ears, I know, of Brown's faculty. Uh, people like Professor of Material Engineering Nitin Padchur, uh, he recently secured a $4 million NSF grant to manufacture the next generation of solar cells. His work on this piece of renewable energy puzzle builds on the research of one of his graduate students, Wang Wan Zhao. Wang Wan discovered that perovskite crystals, I've been working on pronouncing that correctly, unlike the silicon used in today's solar panels, can be produced at room temperature simplifying the manufacturing process and greatly reducing costs. This is a big advance. Th this is just one small example of what I see at Brown every day. Intellectually curious minds working together and expanding the realm of the possible. It's, it's a really beautiful thing. 
and it impacts the lives of people here at Brown and well beyond Brown. Now, I could easily summon a number, any number, of testimonials affirming just how powerful the open curriculum is. I, you know, many of the alumni in the room could probably stand up and do it very well themselves. But I want to note just one from a student who graduated last May. Uh, her name is uh, Ada Alazar, and she's a young woman from Eritrea who Brown was lucky to attract with a commitment of financial aid. She majored in neuroscience. She wants to heal the world someday as a health practitioner. Uh, happily for us, she has decided to remain at Brown in our medical school, so she'll have another chance to graduate in four years' time. Reflecting on Brown's unique approach to learning, Ada said it this way. At Brown, you cultivate your own education, you think for yourself, you have to be your own person. This is Brown, a spirited community with its sights set on bettering the human, humankind, and we want to keep it that way. We want to keep attracting teacher scholars who see around corners. We want to keep attracting the students who see the creases. We want to keep harnessing the full potential and unlimited opportunities of the open curriculum. To do that, we have to make some investments. And that means investing further in endowed faculty chairs that will recruit and retain a talented and diverse faculty, will bolster undergraduate scholarships for students like Ada, students, international students, lower income students, middle income students, as well as graduate medical fellowship support. This will attract the kind of intelligent, independent people who will thrive in Brown's ecosystem. Pushing boundaries drives academic excellence, we know that. And moving forward, it's, it's going to be the people of Brown, the people we bring here, who make that happen. Let me turn to programs. What is it about Brown's academic programs that elicits the collaboration that's so valued here? And why is collaboration important? You hear universities talk about it all the time. I would suggest that the global challenges of our time demand collaboration. These are the challenges that fill the news cycles every day. They vex conventional wisdom. They thwart human aspiration. And you know, re pick up a newspaper. Just take your pick. Uh, we're looking at problems of climate change, decimated species, degraded habitats across the pla uh, planet. We're thinking about the chasm of inequity that exists between the top 1% and the millions of people who live on a dollar a day or less. We're looking at vanishing art forms and traditional cultures and an uncharted terrain of managing big data in, for the social good in a way that protects privacy and confidentiality, just to name a few. I believe that these challenges and so many others will be most powerfully addressed by collaborative education and research that brings together students and faculty across disciplines and I can tell you one thing I believe 100%, that nobody does collaboration as well as Brown does. So Brown's rigorous and inventive academic programs, the ones we have existing, the ones we have planned for the future, will do more of what Brown has done for every generation. Emphasize collaboration in preparing students to innovate, push the boundaries of knowledge, and evolve into deep thinkers and doers. So what might students do through these programs? I can't give you a complete inventory tonight, but just a few examples. They may travel around the world through their work with the Climate Development Lab at the new Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. Or through our new arts initiative, they might travel abroad to learn how the arts can be used to understand history and culture, communicate knowledge, and drive social change. As a whole, these programs and others enable the intellectual work of our students to come alive and potentially contribute to solutions that honor tomorrow's promise of a better world. Earlier this year, actually just last summer, I had a group of undergraduates in my office for coffee and cookies. The cookies help bring them in. Uh, and all of them were participants in the Undergraduate Teaching and Research Award Program, what we call UTRAs here at Brown, long tradition of UTRAs. And these are awards for summer students in the summer to conduct original research. One of these students was Chibika Mnuizu, who's in the class of 2017. 
Uh, he is an applied math and biology concentrator. He's working very closely with faculty in a very collaborative way on research to develop a novel drug deployment strategy to control drug-resistant malaria. Uh, at the moment, and I saw him since then, he's sorting out something that he very much wants to do, which is to get to Thailand to learn more about putting his ideas and the things he learned last summer into practice. His work aligns perfectly with one of the areas of collaborative education and research that we're building at Brown, deciphering disease and improving population health. And this work is aimed directly at a really serious global challenge, and it embodies the cross-disciplinary approach that we uh, follow, and that really defines Brown University. As these and other academic programs take root and grow, I believe that Brown will cement and, and grow its reputation as a place where the novel is really routine. Brown will be the place that continues to bring neurosurgeons and engineers together to improve the lives of people with different neurological disorders. Uh, we have a great group working in that area. This is going to be the place where economists, public health experts, and anthropologists at the Watson Institute tackle development problems. And this is going to be the place where technology, design, art, and literature combine to generate fresh cultural narratives. Beyond our very exceptional collaborative research and educational opportunities, Brown students are supported in numerous other ways. And for those of you who come to the Q&A tomorrow, I hope I get to tell you about some of these in more depth. For example, we're developing a new learning commons at Brown that will help students hone their writing skills, reading, data analysis, problem solving, and communication skills. A new initiative in entrepreneurship is in the works, aimed at connecting students to local and global communities, putting their ideas to practice, but in a way that builds on a very strong and deep academic foundation. Further investments are planned for Brown Connect, uh, this is a program that was launched last November that links students to alumni and to Brown parents uh, for advice, help, financial support, getting internships that will help prepare them for their careers after Brown. All of these programs, they sound very diverse and they are, but they all stem from the idea that an open education in the liberal arts and sciences that provides students with opportunities, not with boundaries, is the best way to position them for lives of meaning and purpose when they leave here. So finally, let's talk about the campus community. And you know, this is an inspiring place. What is it about the Brown campus that continues to inspire us generation after generation? And I think the short answer is that we're perpetually open to change. And that word open there is again, we're open to change in ways that nourish our vision, progressive, humanist, tolerant. This is reflected in the beautiful campus that you see around you. This is a campus that builds on Brown's history, but it's also always evolving. But I think it's also reflected in more fundamental ways, again, coming back to the people who make up this great community. Earlier this year, I read a letter, a beautiful letter to the editor, published in the Brown Alumni Magazine. Some of you may have read it as well. It was written by Larry Kramer. He's in the class of 1980. He's former dean of Stanford Law School and currently president of the Hewlett Foundation in California. And what Larry described was his visit to campus on the occasion of his 35th class reunion. And he offered an observation on the Brown University class of 2015. So this was just last spring. Now, as Larry watched the alumni, starting from the oldest alumni through to more recent classes, and then finally to the graduates marching through the Van Winkle Gates and down College Hill, he found himself thinking about how much Brown has changed, the Brown community has changed. He wrote that he wasn't so much struck by the visible visibly different composition of the class of 2015 with its large numbers of students of color, international students, people from all different places. Indeed, many more were there than in previous classes. Rather, he was struck by the changing comportment of graduating classes, beginning with the class of 2005. 
This was the first time he observed in which people from these different groups began marching together, uh, rather than walking separately in their own tightly isolated communities. So just last May, this is what Larry witnessed, and I quote, Finally came the graduating class of 2015, a magnificent kaleidoscope of people from all different backgrounds, now nearly a majority-minority class, mixed and jumbled together, seemingly without regard for race or ethnic background. Many of these graduates openly celebrated their sexual diversity, too, proud and unashamed in a way that, once again, stood in sharp contrast to my own class, in which scarcely anyone was yet willing to be openly gay or lesbian. The spectacle was beautiful and intensely moving. Now, Larry's observation goes to a point I made at the outset of my talk this evening. The evolution of institutions of higher learning like Brown, it carries on with the times. It's driven by new investments in the things that make them stronger at the same time that it safeguards the values that made them distinctive in the first place. The community of Brown then continues to aspire us because there seems to be no limit to how wide open it will open its mind and its heart. It inspires us because it stands for inclusion and diversity and breaking down barriers to hope. And it inspires us because it opens up space for everybody. Here I want to offer one final story, and that's of Alejandro Claudia, class of 2018. Uh, Alejandro was born in the Dominican Republic. He was raised in the West End of Providence. And he's one of a growing number of first-generation students here at Brown, students who are the first in their families to attend college. A growing body of research indicates that first-gen students wrestle with a number of issues, their identities, stigma, the breakaway guilt of being the first in their families, and something that all students have to address, acclimating to being at college. Alejandro is pursuing an independent concentration in political science, economics, and philosophy. Brown students tend to put many things together. Uh, he's active in the Rhode Island Urban Debate League, and lucky for me, he participates in the presidential host program, welcoming and greeting university leaders, alumni, and special guests at lectures, receptions, and private dinners. I'm proud of the efforts that Brown has undertaken to support Alejandro and other first-gen students. At Brown, they've been very active. They have been leaders. Uh, and they've put Brown on the national stage in raising awareness of the challenges they face, as well as the remarkable assets that they bring to our community. And we're committed to developing campus resources to help them truly thrive. So this is the community of Brown. Uh, it's evolving again, it's opening its doors, it's changing its culture so that everyone can have the transformative experience that we offer. Now, you know, I say this not to say that everything is perfect. Uh, events across the nation as well as on college campuses during the last year and a half and more tell us otherwise. Uh, racial inequalities, socioeconomic inequalities, these things persist. And we see them in a microcosm, often in a very intense way on college campuses. But I'm actually filled with optimism. I think college campuses are the places that will lead, lead in driving positive social change going forward. As Larry Kramer concluded in his letter, it was, quote, impossible to see the pageant of the class of 2015 without realizing how much progress has been made, how different and how much better our society has become, and how much hope we really ought to have for its future. It's my hope that when our current first-year students, long after they've graduated, gather for reunion and watch the class of well, it's their 35th reunion, it would be the class of 2054, that's a little scary. When they see that class parade down College Hill, that Brown's commitment to inclusion and diversity will be evident once again, maybe in ways that we can't even imagine now. To close, I'll say that as parents, and I count myself as one, we send our children to college trusting that when they graduate, some permutation of success, stability, income, character will be apparent. We hope that. And of course, we're never quite sure how it's going to play out, because every student is different and will have an experience that is completely their own, or in this case, maybe distinctively brown. 
Yet someday, our graduates will see in their work the power that comes from pushing boundaries and taking risks. Perhaps in the same way that Ed, which Dantecott, the marvelous Haitian writer and graduate of Brown's creative writing program, saw in the power in hers. Uh, Edwidge said of her craft, and I quote, create dangerously for people who read dangerously. Writing, knowing in part that no matter how trivial your words may seem, someday, somewhere, someone may risk his or her life to read them. This is a way of saying that today's Brown is and tomorrow's Brown will be a place that really unleashes its graduates on the world. So what I would encourage you to trust that you can really hang on to is the transformative power of higher education. That's what Brown aims to unleash. It flows from how our students interact with knowledge, ideas, and the people who bear them. And it derives from moments when insight courses through their minds, the proverbial light bulb switches on and they think, this is what inspires me. This is what I want to explore. This is what I love. So thank you all so much for your gracious attention and have a wonderful family and alumni weekend. And I Thank think you. we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Is this on? Are we on? Yeah. yeah you're on. So, uh, thank you, President Paxton, uh, for those wonderful remarks. Uh, before the, um, the the speech, Marcy and I went around and asked a couple of people if they had questions that they want to ask. We know a bunch of people uh, want to get onto their dinner reservations, so we picked out sort of three that we thought would be appropriate. So, you mentioned in your remarks about some of the support that the university is now providing for first gen for first-gen students. Can you talk a little bit more generally about what type of support uh, for students the university provides and how that's changed, right. perhaps, over the past 10 years? So, so I think it's changing in a couple ways. And I'm looking at our dean of the college, who's really been uh, at the forefront of advancing a lot of the very positive changes. Uh, one is, I mentioned the learning commons. And I think the, the idea of the learning commons is really important, because when you have an open curriculum, students are not forced to take any one course. Uh, we need to make sure that students have the ability to hone core skills, you know, writing, reading, reasoning, data fluency. And don't think of this as being remedial. You know, all of our students come in with strengths and weaknesses, and even, you know, some of our strongest writers want to get better. So the learning commons will be something that serves all students in the university. So very good academic support. The, the other thing I would note is that uh, I think we're becoming increasingly aware of the need to, to help students with um, social support, health support, and mental health support. Uh, we spent a lot of time in campus in the last year talking about how to improve our mental health services. Uh, more and more students who probably couldn't go to school in the past because of mental health problems are now able to come to college, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, but these are students who then also need uh, support managing stress and dealing with health issues. So we're, we're building support in these areas. I think it's tremendously important. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, you touched on this a bit in your remarks, um, but may, perhaps you can elaborate a bit about undergraduate research opportunities and our lab opportunities available for undergrads in addition to graduate students. Yeah, so, so the question is, what are the research opportunities available to students? And you know, what, one thing I would say is Brown faculty love to work with they're graduate students, of course, but also they're undergraduate students. So there are many, many opportunities for students to engage in research. Uh, the obvious place where that happens is in laboratories, because you, know, you need a lot of hands to get that work done. And the UTRAs that I talked about, the summer um, opportunities as well as opportunities during the year, often support science students. But it's not only science students. You know, we have students who are working with humanists, with social scientists. Uh, I, one of the other UTRA students who I met with last summer uh, was working with a faculty member on the translation from Arabic of an ancient manuscript from Timbuktu. I mean, it was, it was really cool. It was all about magic. Uh, so, you know, the student was very excited. The, the group of students I had in the room came from all disciplines, and the thing that I love was I said, 
tell me, you know, which of you will be published? Which of the work, you know, will you be published based on the work that you're doing this summer? And uh, probably three quarters of them raised their hands and said yes. So they're, they're not just doing the research assistance, they're driving the research with their faculty members. It's great. Okay, so the last question, uh, and you touched on it uh, in your remarks. Uh, it's early days, but... I talked about too much. But you're now just, uh, you're not just the president, but you're also a parent at, yes. uh, at Brown. So tell us a little bit about uh, what that's like, the new perspective. Well, I'm a month into this, like all the other first-year parents in the audience, which means I've spoken to my son maybe three times. <laughs> I've received some text messages, which really make me feel great. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's actually, I, I find it wonderful to see, uh, see the adjustments, see him get into his classes, see him love his professors. Uh, I, I haven't talked to him since midterm started, so I, 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 you'll have to ask me that next year. Yeah, but, but it, it is, it's, it's really nice to see things from the other side. I mean, this summer, I was getting the same emails and notices and forms to fill out, or at least he was, that all of you were. Uh, I went and actually sat with him while we did the sexual harassment and assault training, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, so uh, I, I, I feel like I'm more connected to what parents and families are going through, and students as well. And I like that. That's not why he came to Brown, uh, but uh, it, it's turning out to be good for me too. So, yeah. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Have fun.